Let's try this again. Hi, I'm Judy Fritz. I'm Vice President at the Tech Museum of Innovation. I'm pleased to welcome you to our first in our series of Meet the Authors and welcome you to beautiful downtown San Jose in the heart of Silicon Valley. Um, we couldn't have uh, a better occasion to launch our Meet the Authors series than to begin a new year and begin in a beautiful new museum. And to start our series, we're very fortunate to have Ray Kurzweil. And he's a wonderful individual, and obviously you've heard something about him or we wouldn't have such a great uh, turnout tonight. But let me give you a little bit of background in terms of Ray and put, it a, put his background in the context of the work he's been doing over the years and what brought him to us today as an author of a brand new book. And we'll begin with, he was the first to pioneer in the print-to-speech reading machine for the blind. He was the first to pioneer in the OmniFont, which is any font, optical character recognition. He was also the first to do text-to-speech synthesizer and the first music synthesizer capable of recreating the grand piano and other orchestral instruments. He was the first to commercially market large vocabulary speech recognition. And Ray has successfully found founded, built, and sold four high-tech companies. I think successfully selling is kind of a key thing in there. <laughs> He's had a long association with artificial intelligence. And so in 1990, he published through MIT Press, The Age of Intelligent Machines, which was named the most outstanding computer science book of 1990 uh, by the American Association of Publishers. His successful pr predictions have made Ray's book uh, as one of the early forecasters of the emergence of the World Wide Web. And he also predicted that the World Chess Championship would be taken by a, uh, by, by a computer. He also has forecast the role of intelligent weapons in warfare and also its central role in the continued economic expansion as we move into a global economy. Ray Kurzweil has received scores of national and international awards, including the 1994 Dixon Prize through Carnegie Mellon University's uh, science program, and it's their top science prize. He was named Engineer of the Year from Design News. He was also named Inventor of the Year by MIT, and he is a recipient of the Grace Mary Hopper Award from the Association of Computing Machinery. He has received nine honorary doctorates and honors from two U.S. presidents. He has also received seven national and international film awards. I also have to say, in reading his book, he also has included the most interesting notes. The book is wonderful, but the notes at the end are also great reading. So he's an incredibly interesting individual, and we're pleased to have Ray tonight. So please join me in welcoming Ray Kurzweil. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for that introduction. I was hoping someone would notice those notes. Uh, I'm not sure. The book just came out, so I'm not sure people have made it that far. So you must be a good reader. Uh, it's a beautiful museum, and I wish you a lot of luck. I'm sure it will be very successful. I appreciate you all coming out on a beautiful night. Uh, we're going to start with a little dramatic reading, and I'm going to share with you some 1999 technology. And then we'll talk about technology in the 21st century and how that will impact humankind. So I'm going to show you some uh, speech recognition technology and int introduce you to my book. Since the uh, acoustics here are a little unusual. We're going to uh, start with by calibrating the the microphone so it's used to the acoustic environment. Testing. Might help if I turn it on. Testing. 
One. Testing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Open word. The gambler had not expected, the gambler had not expected to be here, period. Open word. The gambler had not expected The gambler had not expected to be here, period. But on reflection, he thought he had shown some kindness in his time, period. And this place was even more beautiful and satisfying than he had imagined, period. Everywhere there were magnificent crystal chandeliers the finest handmade carpets, the most sumptuous foods, and yes, the most beautiful women who seemed intrigued with their new heaven-made period. He tried his hand at roulette, and amazingly, his number came up time after time, period. He tried the gaming tables, and his luck was nothing short of remarkable, period. He won game after game, period. Indeed, his winnings were causing quite a stir, attracting much excitement from the attentive staff and from the beautiful women, period. New paragraph. This continued day after day, week after week, with the gambler winning every game, accumulating bigger and bigger earnings, period. Everything was going his way, period. He just kept on winning, period. And week after week, month after month, the gambler's streak of success remained unbreakable, period. New paragraph. After a while, this started to get tedious, period. The gambler was getting restless. The winning was starting to lose its meaning, period. But nothing changed, period. He just kept on winning every game until one day the now anguished gambler turned to the angel who seemed to be in charge and said that he couldn't take it anymore, period. Heaven was not for him after all, period. He had figured he was destined for the other place anyway. And indeed, that is where he wanted to be, period. But this is the other place. <laughs> Italicized the last six words. Came the reply, period, new paragraph. This is my recollection of an episode of the Twilight Zone capitalize the last two words, that I saw as a young child, period. I don't recall the title, but I would call it, Be Careful What You Wish For, period. As this engaging series liked to do, it illustrated one of the paradoxes of human nature, period. We like to solve problems, but we don't want them all solved, not too quickly anyway, period. We are more attached to the problems than to the solutions, period. New paragraph. Take death, for example. Example, period. A great deal of our effort goes into avoiding it, period. We make extraordinary efforts to delay it, and indeed often consider its intrusion a tragic event, period. Yet we would find it hard to live without it, period. Death gives meaning to our lives, period. It gives importance and value to time, period. Time would become meaningless if there were too much of it, period. If death were indefinitely put off, the human psyche would end up 
well, comma, like the gambler in the Twilight Zone episode, period. We do not yet have this predicament, period. We have no shortage today of either death or human problems, period. Few observers feel that the 20th century has left us with too much of a good thing, period. There's growing prosperity, fueled not incidentally by information technology, but the human species is still challenged by issues and difficulties not altogether different than those with which it has struggled from the beginning of its recorded history, period. The 21st century will be different, period. New paragraph. The human species, along with the computational technology it created, will be able to solve age-old problems of need, if not desire, and will be in a position to change the nature of mortality in a post-biological future period. Do we have the psychological capacity for all the good things that await us, question mark? Probably not, period. That, however, might change as well, period. Before the next century is over, human beings will no longer be the most intelligent or capable type of entity on the planet, period. Actually, let me take that back, period. The truth of that last statement depends on how we define human, period. And here we see one profound difference between these two centuries, period. Unlike the 20th century, the primary political and philosophical issue of the next century will be the definition of who we are, period. Close application. Yes. The Age of Spiritual Machines prologue. Save. Yes. Now, I did, uh, I'm going to leave this on for a minute because I'm going to show you a couple other graphs. Uh, if I were actually dictating a document, I would have corrected the mistakes as, as I go along, and there are some mechanisms to correct mistakes. I did actually dictate uh, most of the book uh, using this particular software, which is the Kurzweil Speech Recognition, which we developed at Kurzweil Applied Intelligence. It's now uh, part of a company called Learn Out in Housefee. It's called Voice Express. It is a good illustration of one of the strengths of machine intelligence, which is the ability of machines to share their knowledge. I mean, if I learn French, I can't download that knowledge to you. You've got to spend this several years also in the same painstaking way learning French. If I read War and Peace, I can't download that knowledge to you. But machines can share their knowledge. We actually taught one computer how to recognize human speech. And we did it similarly to the way you would uh, teach a child. We have thousands of hours of recorded speech, and we have millions of words of text. And we, we don't tell the machine in advance. We don't feed it rules. Well, this is what a P-plosive looks like. This is what an E-vowel looks like. These are how, this is how words are put together syntactically. We use certain techniques uh, similar to what are called neural nets, where the system kind of organizes itself and develops its own rules that it evolves over time, being exposed repeatedly to all of this massive amount of information. And at first it makes mistakes and we correct it, and it, it adjusts itself based on those corrections. And like a child, it eventually learns to recognize human speech. And it took us several years to do that. The strength of, of machine intelligence is that now that one machine can share its knowledge with millions of other computers. If you want to load that program on your computer, it only takes a few seconds. Computers can share their knowledge. We don't have a quick downloading port on our neurons. I'll, I'll come back to that. But that's one of the strengths of, of human intelligence, of machine intelligence. Now, human intelligence today exceeds human intelligence in, in a variety of ways. But machines will ultimately meet that critical level of, of human intelligence in all of its broad diversity. And I'll, I'll have uh, quite a bit more to say about that. But I do want to make the point that once a machine achieves that critical level, it'll necessarily soar past it because machines can share their knowledge. We'll have machines by 2015 that can really understand knowledge and language. You'll be able to read all the world's literature, which will all be out on the web. And every machine will, ultimate, will be able to be a master of all human and machine-acquired knowledge. Now, I'd like to talk about how we're going to achieve that, or how the human machine civilization will achieve that, and then what some of the implications will be. 
Computers are getting more powerful uh, at a very rapid rate. Computing is growing exponentially. Uh, how many people here have heard of Moore's Law? Uh, it's interesting. I mean, the, the percentage of hands that go up when I ask that question over the years is, has accelerated also. Uh, <laughs> actually, three or four years ago, very few people outside of the com computer industry had, had heard of it. Uh, and this is a phenomenon that's actually been going on for a long time. And no one really noticed it uh, until Gordon Moore, who was then uh, chairman of Intel, first put out a crude version of it in the 60s, refined it in the 1970s. And what Moore's law says is, I mean, technically, it says that the size of a transistor, which is not this big, they're microscopic, but the, the amount of real estate or size of a, of a transistor on an integrated circuit is shrinking by 50% every two years. The implication is that you can then put twice as many of them on a chip. And they also run faster because if they're smaller, the electrons have, don't have to travel as far. And since they go near the speed of light, that speeds them up. So every two years, circuits run faster, and we can have twice as much stuff on, the, on a chip. And you only have to open up your morning paper to see the implications of that. You, today, for $500, you can buy a computer that's more powerful than all of MIT had or Stanford not that many years ago. Uh, now, in considering the future, which is something I've been interested in for a couple of decades, a, a salient question about the 21st century is how long can this go on? Now, that particular paradigm of shrinking, shrinking transistors is going to break down by around the year 2019, some, somewhere between 2015 and 2019. At that point, the key features of, of transistors will only be a few atoms in width. So we won't be able to shrink them anymore. So is that the end? Well, that's the end of Moore's law, but is that the end of the exponential growth of computing? Now, there hasn't been actually that much written that I've seen on the nature of this trend. People call it, well, it's just a set of industry expectations. People expect things to double every two years or 18 months, depending on the version. So we just keep doing that. And we, we, since we expect it, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. But what, what I've discovered in examining the, the true nature of Moore's law is that it's really part of a much more fundamental phenomenon uh, that, dis that really describes any evolutionary process. Now, let me show you a couple of charts. I took 49 famous computers and put them on this logarithmic chart going back to 1900. Each one of those little dots is a, uh, is a computer. Uh, and in fact, right, right there is the uh, computer that Turing built that cracked the Enigma code that enabled Britain to win the, the Battle of Britain. Over here is the computer that CBS used to predict the election of Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, Here's the uh, PC you just bought for your son uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, and there's a couple of interesting things that we might notice from this chart. First, the exponential growth of computing didn't start with Moore's law, because Moore's law concerns integrated circuits, so-called chips. We didn't have chips until 1957. In fact, Moore's law is not the first, but the fifth paradigm to produce exponential growth of computing. The, this particular chart is what we call a logarithmic chart. Uh, as you go up this uh, y-axis, every uh, vertic uh, horizontal bar here represents a factor of 100. So a straight line across time in this chart represents exponential growth. And in indeed, we can see that computers have been growing exponentially uh, for 100 years. We had electromechanical calculators around this time, then we had relay-based computers, vacuum tubes, transistors, and finally integrated circuits. So Moore's law is the fifth paradigm to produce exponential growth of computing. And in fact, Moore's law is an example of the exponential growth of any, of any evolutionary process. I talk in, in the book about some of the roots of this process and link the speed of a process to chaos. If there's a lot of chaos in a process, things go more slowly. In evolutionary process, things get more and more ordered. And as order increases, time speeds up, processes go faster. 
And you can see that in the, uh, well, if you look at the universe, chaos has been increasing, and so time has been slowing down. When in the beginning of the universe, we had three paradigm shifts in the first billionth of a second, and now things happen much more slowly in the universe. In, the, in an evolutionary process here on Earth, it took billions of years for the first cells to form. Then later on in that process, it took only a few hundred thousand years for us to go from the primate, upper primates to Homo sapiens, which is a flash, a wink of an eye in evolutionary terms. If you look at technology, that also took us eons, at least in human terms, to get started. It took us tens of thousands of years to figure out if you sharpen both sides of a stone, it created a sharp edge. The key thing about technology is that these innovations stuck and each level of innovation provided the means and the tools and the knowledge for the next level. That's what allows an evolutionary process to speed up. So today we have major changes, paradigm shifts in a few years time. The whole World Wide Web didn't exist just a few years ago. And we achieved more in the first 20 years of the 20th century than we did in the entire 19th century. We achieved more in the 19th century than we did in the 18th centuries before that. And we'll achieve more in the next 20 years than we did in the entire 20th century, which is quite a bit. So an evolutionary process keeps getting faster. That's the true nature of this exponential growth of computing. It took us 90 years to achieve the first MIP, million instructions per second, for $1,000. Now we add another MIP per $1,000 every day. So things are getting faster and faster. The other interesting thing about this chart is that that isn't the straight line. That curve is actually the beginning of another exponential. There's actually exponential growth in the rate of exponential growth. At the beginning of the century, we doubled computation every three years. Here, around 1950, we doubled the power of computing every two years. The last 15 years, we've been doubling it every one year. Now, if we project that out into the 21st century, and this is a conservative look because I've actually only considered one level of exponential growth, I ignored the exponential growth or the rate of exponential growth. But taking a uh, conservative look at it, okay, we see the, uh, that I, the first uh, century of computation here. Uh, and right now, a thousand dollar personal computer comes to 20 million billion calculations per second, or about 20 billion MIPS. Uh, well, it's, it's the nature of exponential growth that things start out very slowly and then really explode. Nobody noticed that computation was growing exponentially for the first 50 years of that process. Then one guy noticed it, Alan Turing, and he wrote about it in the, in the journal Mind in 1950. It was forgotten. Nobody noticed it again until around 1970 when, when Gordon Moore postulated what became known as Moore's Law. And still was only known by a fairly small number of technical people. Recently, we've all noticed it. If you open up the magazine ads, you see that the latest computer is far more powerful than it was a week ago, and you can't even unwrap a computer and uh, prevent it from being obsolete by the time you plug it in. Uh, by 2029, a, a $1,000 computer will be equal to a village of human brains, a thousand of them. Uh, by 2060, $1,000 of computation, which won't be in a little box anymore. We'll talk a little bit more about what the nature of computation will be. It will be equal to uh, all human brains on Earth, at least as we know them today. So we can turn that off. I tell a little story in the book about the uh, inventor of chess and his patron, the Emperor of China which illustrates the power of exponential growth. The emperor was so thrilled with the game, he said, I'll give you anything you want in the kingdom. And he said, all right, I'll have one grain of rice on the first square of the chessboard. And the emperor said, one grain of rice? That's all you want? And he says, well, OK. I'll have two grains of rice on the second square and four grains of rice in the third square, and you can fill out the rest of the chessboard. And the emperor immediately granted the inventor's seemingly humble request and one version of the story has the emperor going bankrupt because it ultimately equaled 18 million trillion grains of rice, which he figured out would require rice paddies covering twice the surface area of the earth, oceans included. Uh, another version of the story has the inventor losing his head. <laughs> now, it's a, it's a 
Interesting to note, though, that as they went through the first half of the chessboard, things were fairly uneventful. After 32 squares, it only equaled one, about 8 billion grains of rice, which is about one field's worth. Uh, the emperor did start to take notice, though, that things were, uh, were escalating. He kind of noticed the power of exponential growth. But he could still remain an emperor, and the inventor could still retain his head. It's just as they went into the second half of the chessboard that things started to get interesting, uh, and, and one of them got into trouble. Well, where, where we stand right now is that there have been 32 doublings of, of performance since the first operating computers. So we're right now have covered, finished the first half of the chessboard. And indeed, people are starting to take notice. But it says we go into the second half of the chessboard, which is really the 21st century, the things start to get interesting. And I'd like to talk a little bit about what we'll see when we get there. But I do examine the issue of why this exponential growth will continue. It's not going to die when this fifth paradigm, that is Moore's law of integrated circuits, dies. There'll be other paradigms, a sixth paradigm to take over. One I think that's most likely is something called nanotubes, which are little molecules built out of pentagonal arrays of carbon atoms that are extremely strong in little tubes. And you can make any kind of electronic circuit with them, and you can build them in three dimensions. Uh, and they're extremely dense. And this is not far out technology. I mean, all the things I talk about in the book are, are really based on technologies we can touch and feel today. This is a really a conservative set of projections. A one inch cube of, of nanotube circuitry would be equal a million times the power of the human brain. So, and we have other technologies which I talk about, molecular computing, DNA computing, optical computing, uh, crystalline computing, Something even more dramatic is called quantum computing. There are plenty of new computing technologies in the wings to take over from Moore's law when that particular paradigm breaks down. It's really part of the basic nature of an evolutionary process. And technology is, ev is an evolutionary process. And it continually accelerates. And people, people are noticing that things are accelerating. Things are moving much more, more quickly. So <coughs> just nanotubes alone will bring us to what 2060, at which point $1,000 a, a computation will equal uh, 10 billion times the power of the human brain. So that's the hardware of intelligence. Uh, we, will have, we will have the capacity. We don't have it today. Even with the best software, our notebook computers have the processing power of an insect brain. So we can master specific, fairly narrow intelligent tasks. But our computers, when they go outside of a particular task, that program that recognizes speech, which is modestly intelligent, uh, goes out when you go outside of that area, it becomes an idiot savant. Uh, Deep Blue, which defeated Kasparov, the world chess champion, in chess, is brilliant at chess, it goes outside of chess, it becomes an idiot. Now, we as humans have somewhat softer fallings from grace when we go outside of our areas of expertise. We're better at, at faking it when we don't really know what we're talking about. <laughs> we, ha we have more generalized ways of thinking. And our, our, our intelligence is generally more flexible. But part of that difference is that factor of a million. We still have to go in terms of the basic memory and processing capacity of the human brain versus our best computers. But even if we have the raw capacity, the memory and speed, that will not automatically give us human level intelligence. The organization the content, the knowledge of those resources, the software of intelligence is even more salient. So let's talk a little bit about how we will organize those formidable resources. One way is with the kinds of research that we've been doing, that, of which I gave you one small example. Uh, we are learning how to master language. Uh, this particular program you can give it commands in natural language. You can tell it how to format the document. You don't have to say it in a specific hard syntax. You can say it in your own words. And so it has a rudimentary ability to understand language. Uh, we are mas learning how to master language, ultimately, just using the, the techniques that we're now developing. Microsoft, for example, has a, a method uh, called MindNet, where they're programming all the different word senses of, of words in, in different languages and how they uh, how they relate to each other, uh, to provide computers the ability to actually understand written documents with some sophistication. We, these, very, these systems today, which are fairly narrow in their intelligence, will broaden over time to, to be more and more flexible and cover 
more and more wider and wider arrays of, of, of intelligent functions. And the way we're going to build those systems is not the way our computers are built today. My own technical background is in pattern recognition, teaching computers to recognize patterns. And we typically use methods there that are different than what has typically been associated with artificial intelligence. AI or artificial intelligence has been associated with systems where we program a priori all the different rules and try to write down human knowledge with sort of strict logical structures uh, using some, what's called symbolic processing. And there's a method that we can do interesting things with it, but it's limited. Much more powerful is, is to try to emulate the kinds of techniques which the human brain uses, which are self-organizing, highly parallel, where we don't tell the machine in advance what to do, but let it organize itself and let solutions emerge from the interaction of, of millions of little processes. I'll talk a little bit more about some examples of that. But we'll, we'll increasingly build our computers using the insights we have into the human brain, massively parallel. I mean, even though our neural circuits are very slow, uh, we have so many things going on in our brain at the same time, 100 trillion calculations simultaneously, that it's extremely powerful. And human intelligence, in fact, is based on pattern recognition. We recognize patterns in situation and call upon our memory of previously thought about situations in order to function in the world, because we can't think fast enough to think new thoughts in real time. We have to really rely upon things we've thought about before. There was a lot of reporting during this Kasparov match that, well, Kasparov was really thinking deep thoughts about chess, whereas Deep Blue, the computer, was just doing this mechanical kind of rote calculation. One could take a different perspective on that. Kasparov didn't have time to think new thoughts about chess while he's playing the game. So he, a chess master has thought about 50 to 100,000 different chess positions. That's what, why it takes decades to become a chess master. And as different situations presented him, present, were presented to him during the game, he recognized situations that he had thought about before using pattern recognition. Oh, well, that's like this other situation which I spent hours thinking about. And then he can draw upon that memory of previously thought about situations. He doesn't have time to think about them during the match. Deep Blue, on the other hand, actually was thinking about, well, if I go here, he might go here, and then I'll go here, and in, in a matter of seconds could actually think about or compute billions of different move, counter, move situations. But pattern, rec pattern recognition is a very powerful paradigm, and increasingly we'll be building computers that do that, that are massively parallel, that are self-organizing, that evolve their own sort of emergent solutions to problems. But there's another paradigm that I'd like to share with you that I think is more compelling, which is we have an example of, of, intelli of an intelligent entity, of a very intelligent entity right in front of us. In fact, we have, as I understand it, 250 examples in this room. And this intelligent entity is right within us. And it's not impossible to probe its secrets. The human brain is complicated. It's very complicated, but it's not infinitely complicated. We, we have, and this is fairly recent research, uh, been able to take clusters of hundreds of mammalian neurons and completely replicate uh, their functionality, create a basic electronic device that acts the same way. I'm not talking about what's called neural nets, which are simp mathematically simplified models of neurons. I'm talking about something as complex as these clusters of neurons. Uh, now, a neuron is fairly complicated, but it's not that complicated. We can understand how a neuron works. And we've already been able to replicate hundreds of them. Scaling up from hundreds to billions is something we do in engineering and in the technology world all the time. Now, we are already probing and looking at the human brain to understand its secrets. We can look inside your brain today and see individual nerve cells and see them fire. Uh, with uh, non-invasive scanning technologies, there's a number of them I talk about in the book, magnetic resonance imaging, for example. You can see individual somas or neuron cell bodies. With the next generation of magnetic resonance imaging, we'll be able to see the connections between the neurons. The generation after that, we'll be able to actually see the neurotransmitter strengths, which is the site of human learning. Why is scanning getting more powerful? Well, it's again, the, it's an, another example of the law of accelerating returns, the exponential growth of any technology. And in fact, specifically, the reason that these scanning technologies are getting faster and more precise with each new generation is because the computers are getting more powerful. 
because it takes a lot of computation to build these very precise three-dimensional models. It's a very conservative statement to say that by the 2020s, I think it'll be, in fact, before that, but certainly in the 2020s, when we have computers that could actually have the processing power to replicate the human brain, we will have the means to scan the entire human brain, let's say my brain, and make a, and make a map of everything that's going on, all the connections, all the neurotransmitter strengths, and have a database, a massive database of trillions of bytes of information representing the state of a human brain at that time. Now there's a couple of different things we can do with that information. One thing we're already doing is learning about the human brain and how it works. This will give us more insight into human intelligence, which will be one of the beneficial side effects. This program that I demonstrated to you, in fact, has taken advantage of just those kinds of insights. There's been research using scanning as to how the early auditory cortex works, which is the part of the brain that processes sound. And the brain does certain transformations, change, modifies that information in certain clever ways. And we've basically copied those transformations in this program, and not just us, but this is generally done in, in this field. And that copying the human brain's very clever modifications to sound, the way it processes it, uh, has enabled these systems to become much more accurate. As we learn all the different tricks uh, of the brain, and the brain really isn't one, one organ, it's really hundreds of different specialized information processing organs, uh, we'll be able to essentially tap those secrets. Uh, the brain is not copyrighted, there's no patent on it, uh, so we're really free to, to copy those secrets. This is going to, we're going to be able to use those insights together with the results of the different streams of uh, artificial intelligence, neural net, evolutionary algorithm development to create our intelligent machines. Another scenario is to take that giant database, this map of, let's say, my brain, and reinstantiate it in a neural computer of sufficient capacity, basically let that computer uh, copy all of the local brain processes that, that the scanner has seen in, a, in that particular brain. And what will emerge in the, since that, that entity now will be an exact copy, not using the same methods, it's not using carbon cell based brains, it's not using DNA based protein synthesis, but it's copying the basic information processing methods, which we're beginning to understand what will emerge in the machine will be a new Ray Kurzweil. And he'll say, yeah, I grew up in Queens, New York. I went to MIT. I sold these different companies. I walked into a scanner there, and I woke up in the machine here. Hey, this technology really works. And then once we've done that, we can extend his memory a thousandfold, and he'll be able to think faster. We'll be able to expand various capabilities that he has. And that Ray Kurzweil will achieve a certain form of immortality if he's careful to make frequent backups uh, <laughs> of his mind file. And, you know, when I go from one notebook computer to the next, I don't throw all my files away. I have my technician copy them over to, to my next personal computer. So we're not going to throw our mind file away just because the hardware crashes or as we go to the next very personal computer to embody our, our bodies and our brains. Uh, we'll copy them, and we'll retain that, that information. Uh, there's a little fly in the ointment from my perspective, which is just because there's this entity that thinks it's Ray Kurzweil, because he has, a, he has that memory, uh, that snapshot of all the memories and knowledge that, that I've accumulated over the last several decades that have been on this planet. Uh, I'm still, the old Ray Kurzweil, which is me, is still here in my carbon cell-based brain, and so my consciousness hasn't really been transferred over to this new entity. Uh, in fact, you could have scanned my brain while I was sleeping and go and create this copy. I wouldn't even necessarily know about it. So I'll just probably end up jealous of this guy because he'll share my ambitions and dreams, but he'll be in a much better position than I am to fulfill them. Now, let's talk a little bit about consciousness. I mean, this is one particular scenario. I think, realistically, the, there will be many different combinations of these scenarios. Most of the intelligent entities we meet will not be copies of a specific person, but they'll be based on the general insights we have into the design of human thinking. And these entities will be able to emulate the full range of, of human cognitive ability. Now, human thinking is not just logical thinking. 
It's not just doing mathematics in a better way. In fact, computers already can do that. The, the essence and ultimate capability in, in human thinking is human emotion, the ability to recognize humor, to, 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 be, to be funny, to recognize sadness and loneliness and joy, to experience those emotions. Uh, those are really, that's really the essence and the ultimate in human intelligence. And if we understand these processes, and they are the most subtle, complex, deep and rich phenomena that goes on in the human brain, these new entities will evidence that same kind of rich behavior. We will meet machines in the next century, and what I, what I mean by machines is a non-biological entity, an entity that's not a carbon cell-based entity, that's not based on DNA-guided protein synthesis, but that is nonetheless based on the principles of, of the methods of the human brain, and they will claim to be conscious, they'll claim to have emotional experiences, they'll claim to have spiritual experiences, hence the title of my book, and unlike entities today, because you can meet virtual personalities in your kids' computer games, these 21st century entities will be very compelling. They'll be very convincing when they evidence these things. And in fact, they'll be very intelligent. So they will succeed in convincing us that they are conscious, that they have emotional experiences, and that they have spiritual experiences. But then let's ask the question, are they really having those experiences? Well, this gets to a very important issue and a very difficult one, which is the issue of consciousness. It's something we've been debating for thousands of years, back to the Platonic Dialogues. And of course, so far, it's been a polite and abstract philosopher's debate. One thing I can say about it, when we get to the 21st century, it won't just be an abstract debate. It'll be a very compelling debate, because if these entities claim to be capable of suffering, there's going to be a whole uh, series of ethical, moral, and legal issues that, that stem from that. But there are many different ways of looking at it. People have sharp disagreements about the nature of consciousness. Some people say, no, you cannot have consciousness unless you squirt neurotransmitters. You know, unless it's a biological entity built with DNA, it, it can't be conscious. Well, I don't, that, that's just a statement. I mean, there's no evidence of that. In fact, there's no objective way to penetrate the subjective experience of another entity. Now, we assume that each other a conscious, I assume you're conscious. If I speak much longer, maybe you won't be conscious, but, <laughs> but we do assume that other human beings that act conscious are conscious, uh, but outside of, sh but it's an assumption, but outside of shared human experience, we're not all of like mind about the consciousness of non-human entities. I mean, take animals. A lot of people, I mean, I think my cat's conscious. Now, even that's a human-centric reaction because I see behaviors that I associate with human behaviors. I see it expressing fear or protecting its young or being hungry uh, or angry. And I, I can have some empathy with those behaviors. So I assume it's experiencing something like I've experienced. That doesn't address experiences that other animals might have. There are many animals on Earth, like giant squids, that are extremely complex but have a neurophysiology very different from ours. What's it like to be a giant squid? I mean, we'll never know. We can't penetrate the subjective experience of another entity. So some people say, no, animals aren't conscious. You have to be human to be conscious. It's, it's just a statement. I mean, there's nothing behind that. But, you know, uh, animals just operate by instinct. That's just kind of a simple mechanistic response of the world. And you have to be human to be conscious. How would you ever settle that debate? You can make arguments about it. You can point to different scientific research showing how certain animals' brains are very similar to humans that uh, our DNA is 99% the same, that the, the same kinds of feedback loops that we see in the human brain also exist in the animal brain. Uh, but these are just arguments. You can't really penetrate the subjective experience of these other entities. But we're going to meet that issue again when we have these non-biological entities that act in a very convincing way. In fact, they'll be more convincing than the animals because they really will share the full range of human experience. It'll be based on the human brain. And they will convince most people that they're conscious. But that's a political prediction and not a philosophical one. It ultimately is, is a very mysterious issue, but we can't ignore it for that reason. Uh, and we'll settle it the way we always settle these issues, which is politically. And most people will be convinced because these entities are going to be very convincing. Uh, they'll get mad if we don't agree with them. <laughs> so we, we will come to believe that they are conscious. But that's a little bit different than the philosophical statement that they are conscious. I mean, 
a lot of people in write-ups on my book have said, well, Ray Kurzweil's predicting conscious machines. Our predictions are a little bit different. We're going to have machines that claim to be conscious, and they're going to be very convincing, and we're going to believe them. That's a little bit different than absolutely saying that they are conscious. Well, how, how will this impact human life? This is not an alien invasion of intelligent machines. They're not coming over the horizon to uh, disturb human civilization. It's emerging from within our human machine civilization. These, we already have a very intimate relationship with our computers. If all the computers today in the world stopped, our civilization would grind to a halt. Well, you'd say, well, of course that's true. We built them in, in our cars and power plants and uh, in our banking system and so on. But that wasn't true as recently as 25 years ago. Most of the people in this room have lived through those 25 years. And 25 years ago, if all the computers stopped, a few professors would have been frustrated to not get their printouts from their punch card submissions. A few business reports would have been delayed, but it would not have disrupted human society. So we've made that fateful leap in the last quarter century. We no longer have our hand on the plug. I mean, we are dependent on, on our machines. They're very intimately embedded in our civilization. Already $500 billion in the, in the stock market is controlled by evolutionary al algorithms. I'm not talking about program trading. Program trading is where human beings come up with simple rules, feed those into computers. The computers initiate the trades, but they're based on rules that humans have come up with. Evolutionary algorithms is where the computers not only make the trades, but they come up with the rules. And that's already 5% of the market, of the money in the market. You say, well, 5% is kind of a small percentage, but it was 2% last year. It was 1% the year before. It's going to be 8% next year. It, it will be more than 50% of the market within five or six years. So we're very rapidly, computer intelligence and unpredictable forms of computer intelligence are becoming very intimate in our, in our uh, civilization. We're going to become more intimate with our computers. We're going to ultimately, in many different ways, merge with our technology. We're already putting neural implants in our brains. We have neural implants for Parkinson's disease. <coughs> Parkinson's disease involves the destruction of certain tissues, which we've identified, and there's a little neural implant that can replace the functioning of that, of that little module and basically reverses the symptoms of Parkinson's uh, patients, and I talk about that in the book. There's a uh, neural implant that suppresses the tremors from multiple sclerosis. I have a deaf friend who's completely deaf. Up until the time he got his neural implant, which is called a cochlear implant, which replaces the auditory circuits that they weren't functioning, and I can talk to him on the phone, and he can hear me and understand me. It hasn't made his hearing perfect, but he can understand me on the phone or in a meeting. He could be in the audience here. He doesn't lip read, and he could uh, understand this lecture. Uh, so we're already putting neural implants in the brains of disabled individuals. Well, within 30 years, neural implants won't just be for disabled individuals. There'll be ubiquitous use of them to extend our normal faculties to broaden them, to increase our memories. I mean, we have a hard time remembering a handful of phone numbers. Uh, I forgot the address of the, the museum coming over here, although it's hard to miss since it's a very <laughs> colorful building. Uh, but we will be expanding our human intelligence through, through the use of, of this type of technology. Uh, we'll also have computers that are based on designs of, of, of the human brain that will be acting human in many different ways. So we will be, in many ways, merging with our technology, expanding our human horizons through this type of technology. The, uh, another thing we'll do with these neural implants is that's how we will relate to the World Wide Web. These implants will naturally plug into the ever-present wireless uh, network, or, or internet, and the nature of the World Wide Web will be a, basically a virtual reality environment. Uh, going to a website will mean entering a virtual reality environment. So if you go to the, uh, the Vail skiing uh, website, you'll be able to experience skiing in Vail, and you'll feel the, the, uh, the cold, uh, snowy air brushing against your face. Uh, we could have all been, in fact, geographically disparate. I could have been in Boston, and all of you could have been in different places, but we could still get together in this meeting rather than being in this hall, not that there's anything wrong with this hall, but we could have met in a Mozambique game preserve or a, on a Cancun beach and feel the warm, moist air against our faces. Uh, we will go to virtual reality environments. Some of them will be very much like real reality. 
And they will not be the kind of crude experience that you may have had in arcade virtual reality today. They will be just as compelling and convincing as real reality. And we will go there and we will meet other real people there. And we will meet simulated people. And we will have experiences and relationships with other real people, and in some cases simulated people in virtual reality environments. And some virtual reality environments will have no counterpart in real reality. There'll be sort of fantastic new environments that we could never have experienced before. We'll be able to have new types of experiences. And in fact, designing virtual reality environments will be uh, a new job category that some of you might want to begin training for. Uh, this, this will be very powerful technology. I tend to be myself an optimist, but I did uh, cover the downsides of these, of these technologies. Uh, I mean, one, for example, is the whole issue of self-replication. Uh, biological life is based on self-replication. We start as one little cell, and it keeps multiplying and creates a human being, and all those cells know when to stop replicating. Now, if something goes wrong at any time with the, self, the mechanism that stops self-replication, well, that's a cancer, and that does happen from time to time and is very destructive. We will have new forms of self-replicating entities, for example, self-replicating nanobots, na nanorobots, which are microscopic-sized robots that are intelligent and can replicate themselves. These self-replicating robots are only useful if you have trillions of them. They can go inside our bodies and destroy pathogens and strengthen and expand our bodies and our brains. Uh, they'll be able to create virtual environments in the real world. Uh, it will really that's a, it's a technology that will overcome the unmet material needs of, of, of the human race. But you have the same danger. If any of these, the only way to get the trillions to make it useful is for them to be self-replicating. Otherwise, you could never have enough of them to, to be useful. Well, if any of them ever forget when to stop self-replicating because of some problem that emerges or software error or, or some uh, malevolent intent, they would, all the descendants of that particular self-replicating entity would, would replicate without end with some obvious downside to that. Uh, <laughs> this could be a very powerful weapon of war, but you would have it only self-replicate against a certain enemy. These are very powerful technologies. Uh, the 20th century has seen some very powerful technologies. And we're, take bioengineering, I mean, that's a very, that's a conventional example that is now the cutting edge of medical technology. The progress we've made with AIDS is because of bioengineering. Uh, over the next 10 years, we'll make tremendous progress against cancer and, and all diseases. We understand the information processing basis for disease. So it's a very positive thing, but there's a downside to it. In an average bioengineering lab at, at a routine college, uh, the equipment and means exist to create a self-replicating biological pathogen that it could be extremely destructive. And, it, and the, the means of doing that, the knowledge to do that, is much less sophisticated than, say, to create an atom bomb, and potentially much more destructive, because an atomic bomb at least is local. It's devastating, but local in its effects, where something like this uh, isn't, isn't necessarily local. Well, that's just bioengineering. I mean, that's not uh, looking far into the future. That's technology today. I mean, you, you could do that now. Uh, these new technologies, the 20th century certainly could have worked out worse than it did. I mean, the totalitarian forces could have become predominant. Uh, certainly also could have ended up better than it did. The 21st century will see much more powerful technologies, and we'll be able to realize many of the dreams of, of the human race. <coughs> we'll be able to meet the material needs of, of all human beings. We'll be able to conquer disease, expand our minds and our knowledge and our ability to be creative. But there are also, these technologies can be used in other more destructive ways as well. And the reason I wrote the book was to really show us where we're going. So we see that these, the emergence of these powerful technologies is inevitable. And if we understand what's coming, we can hopefully apply it to uh, furthering our human values. Not that we all agree on what that is, but it is important for society to understand where it's going. So there's more things I could talk about, but I think it would be interesting to take your questions and focus on those issues that uh, interest you. Well, 
Okay, the question is, uh, with this technology, when do you define the technology as being alive? Uh, probably being alive is, is a less interesting issue than the is issue of consciousness, although they're very often uh, similar. Uh, life is sometimes defined as something that can self-replicate on its own without an external uh, agent. And by that definition, you know, contemporary software viruses could be considered to be alive and they live within a certain medium, which is within the network of computers. Certainly, self-replicating nanobots, are very, even though they're small, will be very complex and, in fact, intelligent entities with the capability of self-replicating. So one could consider them alive. Depends on your definition. Some definitions of being alive include DNA-guided protein synthesis. But that, we're not going to be building machines using protein synthesis. Protein, while it's a marvelous uh, material, has a lot of weaknesses. It's very slow. It breaks down. It's not very strong. Uh, the new methods we're going to be using are, are much more uh, powerful. But in terms of self-replication, I mean, we'll see that with, with these technologies within uh, two or three decades. Well, fl flash memory uses a different technique, but we do have nanotubes working in laboratories. Uh, there's a certain molecule called a fullerene, which looks like these uh, Buckminster Fuller buildings. It's based, they're built from these pentagonal arrays of carbon atoms. Uh, if you've ever been to Disney World, that, that building in the, in the middle of Epcot is a, is a fullerene structure. Uh, they realized recently that you could, instead of just building spheres, you could build long tubes of these carbon atoms built, uh, built in a, a pentagonal array. And you could emulate any type of electronic device. You put a small twist in it, it becomes a transistor. If it's straight, it's a superconductor. And you can build these in three-dimensional arrays, and they're extremely strong. This tiny little uh, several atom wide molecule is 50 times stronger than steel. It's virtually indestructible. Uh, it doesn't break down in thermal effects the way our transistors do now, which is why we can't build them in three dimensions. Uh, so th this is, and, and we kind of understand how to do this now. So this is a technology we can touch and feel. I mean, despite the fact that some of the predictions seem surprising to people, these are all based on technologies we can touch and feel today. And I think it's really a conservative look at the future because there, on top of this, there will invariably be some further discontinuities in technology that certainly were in the 20th century that will accelerate some of these processes. How do I know you're not uh, one of these very convincing... <laughs> <laughs> well, we, ha we haven't... Um, I don't know. I'll have to think about that. Uh, we haven't really gotten that far yet. But uh, there will be issues in about the nature of who you're dealing with uh, as we get to uh, the next century. There have been instances where people have been communicating by email and actually were communicating with an automatic intelligence and didn't realize it. But to really do that correctly, it's something called the Turing test, where an entity could communicate over a channel of just sending text and, and be convincing as a human being. And computers are not at that level. Uh, Turing defined this as a, as a test of human intelligence, that you have a, a human judge interviews a computer and a human foil, uh, but can't see them, so they wouldn't be prejudiced against a computer for not having a warm and fuzzy appearance, and basically sends messages, uh, text messages typed on a terminal, and gets messages back. And can ask questions like, well, you know, what did you think of the uh, character development in a civil action? And you, you can today, uh, there, there have been attempts at the Turing test, you can pretty easily unmask the computer today. But when a computer can really stand up to that kind of challenge and can convincingly uh, convince a human judge that it, it's the human or the human can't tell, uh, then the computer is considered to pass the Turing test. And some people say, well, when a computer can pass the Turing test, it's therefore conscious. But that doesn't follow. I mean, what, what the Turing test is is an objective measure of the behavior of this intelligent entity. And it's, it is a good test of human-level intelligence. It, it 
doesn't directly address the, the issue of consciousness. Uh, and we are, Turing felt it would be about 50 years, uh, which means now, but uh, I feel about 2030, uh, computers will be a thousand times more powerful in terms of raw processing power of the human brain. We will be able to scan the whole human brain well before that. Uh, around 2030, I think computers will pass the Turing test. In your talk, you were differentiating what appears to be consciousness and who knows what it really is. That kind of suggests to me that consciousness during the test in 2030 is something that convinces me that it's, it's conscious because it appears to feel pain. What's the difference? That's, uh, that's interesting. I mean, the, the Turing test basically does that. I mean, the, the judge would only, I mean, part of what the judge would assess in, in, the, in these entities is whether or not it's acting human and, and can relate to human emotional issues in a convincing way. The, the key issue that you're adding is sort of removing this, uh, this aspect of having a terminal and just communicating with language because we don't just communicate with strings of language, we communicate with our bodies and our hands and our expressions. Uh, so that's a, a more advanced form of the, the Turing test that an entity could actually present a physical presence uh, that would convince us that it's at a human level. Uh, in your book, you talk about computational density as an indicator of intelligence, but tonight you've talked about more the importance of the emotional component for intelligence. Can you somehow weave those threads together so we can better well, understand? Computational it? density is a necessary but not sufficient condition to emulate human intelligence. I mean, you could have an entity that has tremendous computational density, speed and memory and so on, but not be very intelligent at all. Uh, but you can't create human level intelligence without having the requisite uh, sort of thinking power. Uh, but once we have that capability, there's, there's an obvious source to tap, which is the human brain. Uh, which we can reverse engineer. I mean, just because there's a skull around it doesn't mean we can't penetrate it. And we are doing that already. And if you look at the trends in brain scanning, uh, it's conservative to say in the 2020s that we can completely scan a human brain and at least copy it. It'll probably take us longer to understand what's going on. Once we understand it, we can extend it in various ways and, and use those insights to design machines that aren't necessarily copies of specific people, but are nonetheless intelligent in a human way. Sure, but one, one question is, what is a machine? Uh, in the book, I have, at the end of each chapter, a dialogue with my reader. And she identifies herself, kind of a third of the way through the book, as Molly, a 20-year-old uh, college student. And then as I go into the, uh, the 21st century, I have a chapter on each uh, decade, and I talk about in each chapter what I feel the technology will look like. And then I illustrate it with, with a dialogue with Molly. Molly goes into those future periods and tells us in a dialogue what uh, her life is like and what the intellectual issues are, but then the political issues of those times. And one of the things she points out is that the nature of the, the concept of a machine, the word machine has taken on a different meaning. Uh, if someone were to call you a machine, today it's probably not a compliment because our idea of a machine is something much more brittle, much simpler, much more formulaic than a human. But that kind of reverses itself in the 21st century and she's delighted when someone calls her a machine because that's a supreme uh, compliment in the year 2099. <laughs> so one issue which I alluded to in the little prologue I read is what is human and what is machine. It's not going to be a, an absolutely clear distinction. But certainly, I mean, we are taking steps in that direction. Computers today are designed by humans, but with, with a lot of help from machines. It used to be that we had to work out all the details. Now we just kind of give some general overview, and the computer works out all of the details from, a, from very high level descriptions down to uh, working out many intermediate stages. Uh, and ultimately, the computers will, will be designing themselves, you know, with all of the different stages of that process. Uh, I'll mention uh, a project I'm working on now, which 
is applying evolutionary algorithms to stock market investment. And I mentioned that this is growing rapidly. It's already $500 billion invested by these kinds of algorithms. And these are intelligent methods where not only does the computer implement the strategy, but it comes up with the strategy. And the way we do that is we create a million, approximately, simulated investors in the computer. And each investor is a little software entity that has a chromosome. And the chromosome describes its rules for investing money. And then we let them compete with each other, and we do that with real world market data, which is a tremendous amount. And evolutionary algorithms require real world information that you can that you can model. And it's every second of trading and all the different analyst projections and, and the company perf financial performance data available online. So these million investors fight it out, and only half a million survive into the next generation. And then we have a uh, sexual reproduction uh, simulation where we create offspring, and each has two parents. And from the two parents, it combines the genetic code, the chromosome of the parents, in a way that sort of emulates uh, sexual genetic reproduction and create a new set of offspring. And, now, and then we have them compete with the real world data. So that's one generation of this simulated evolution. We run this process for thousands of generations. Uh, in each stage, uh, they're, con they're continuing to, to refine uh, these rules for investment. At the end of the process, these surviving entities have evolved very clever and, and very often uh, complex and intricate rules for investing money, which work extremely well. The process keeps getting better and better, and it's not predictable how it will turn out. And what this method is able to, to do is to come up with extremely subtle arbitrage methods that a uh, human analyst would never discover. And you can run, rerun the program every week or eventually every day to discover new subtle trends in the market uh, that human analysts would just never notice. And they are discovering that this method does work better than the sort of hit and miss uh, sort of human analysis uh, method. And ultimately, these, these techniques will uh, be used to invest most of the money in the stock market. Back there. The... <laughs> Two questions, I guess. I'm going to cheat a little bit. Um, what is, do you expect a political entity to actually allow this technological entity to go forward? And the other, on these human machines, I mean, how human will they be? Will they have bad days? Will they forget? <laughs> in terms of one question concerned, will there be political proscriptions against some of this technology emerging? Uh, to some extent, there may be ethical and legal political barriers to some of these scenarios. But in large measure, uh, it's impossible to stop the whole, this is the whole sweep of technology. It's not a centralized thing. It's uh, basically all of industry and government around the world in a very decentralized manner creating this technology. And that is one of the positive aspects of it, that it is so decentralized. So you can have a couple of yahoos in a dorm uh, at Stanford uh, do a little dorm project. It's not a serious school project. It's just a hack. They put this little thing. They're not even very good programmers. They put this thing out on the internet for free. They hope that people will use it. It would be kind of fun if they do. Today, that's worth $34 billion. I mean, it's, that's an example of some of the decentralized aspect of this technology. The emergence of technology of this power and scope is, is really inevitable. It is where wealth is being created. That's why we're, we're having all this economic progress, particularly since our country is good at providing the incentives to create this kind of intellectual property. And do you know how much uh, this intellectual property that's been created uh, in Silicon Valley near here? has been worth over the last 10 years? It's a trillion dollars. And that's, and there are some other areas of the country that have been also creating fantastic new wealth. And it's real money, and it really infuses the economy. And that's why these kinds of developments are, I believe, inevitable. Uh, also, it addresses real human needs. I mean, no, who's going to come up and say, no, the deaf should not have cochlear implants, because it's, later on it's going to lead to neural implants, and it's going to be bad things are going to happen. I mean, we, these technologies address real human needs, but, but the technology is very powerful and can be applied in many different ways. Uh, to the, and 
there's not going to be just one kind of entity. We're going to meet many different kinds of entities that will be very intelligent. Uh, they will be imperfect, and they will have bad days and bad minutes uh, <laughs> because they are unpredictable. I mean, the speech recognition I just demonstrated, it's not perfect. It's, I mean, I can speak the same sentence many times and get it right most of the time. Sometimes it'll get it wrong. It'll make different mistakes. It's not a completely predictable process. It's an example of an intelligent process that does emulate the kind of error-prone uh, intelligence of, of human beings. And really, intelligent things are inherently imperfect. Uh, this, this notion, I mean, the one fallacy in the movie 2001, which was a pioneering movie because it was the first time to sort of postulate an artificial intelligent entity. And in fact, the computer was the only emotional entity in the film. <laughs> The astronauts were, were very devoid of emotion. I don't know if it was bad acting or what, but uh, there was this notion that a computer intelligence would be perfect. And since he made a mistake, therefore, he'd, something had, terrible had gone awry and he would have to be destroyed. And he realized, hmm, they're going to realize I have to be destroyed. I better destroy them first to protect the mission. Well, all this chain of, of malevolent thinking started with this uh, notion that a computer would be perfect. But really intelligent... Uh, activities are, are inherently imperfect, and so these intelligent beings will not be perfect either. So, how, how much time do we have? Uh, About four more minutes. Four more minutes. Okay. Well, uh, answer the questions quickly. Uh, how do you see this technology enabling paraplegics to function? Well, I think that's a good specific question. Uh, I think the question. Okay, that's a good specific question. What will this mean for paraplegics? It's something I've been interested in for many years. Uh, we will see. Certainly by 2019, I think uh, it's a good chance we'll see it by 2009, uh, exoskeletal robotic devices that can be easily put on and will enable a paraplegic person to walk and climb stairs and basically overcome the principal drawback of a wheelchair in that it can't go upstairs and can't navigate doorways and steps and so on. Uh, we have an understanding of how to do that. Uh, there's a lot of engineering involved. It's difficult engineering because as you experiment with it, you don't want people to get hurt. But there's ways of dealing with that. Uh, and I think you will see next 10 to 15 years uh, effective devices that will overcome the uh, handicap associated with the, with the disability of paraplegia. I have a 15-year-old son who's fascinated with technology, and he's convinced that he will never die. If he does die, he needs to do it as a carbon life form. Okay, well, it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a dilemma. I think it's hard to continue as a carbon cell-based life form and, uh, and be immortal. Uh, I think other types of, of technologies have a better potential of being immortal. I don't know how we get our own being into those other uh, life forms, because if, if you do the mental thought experiment of of say, I scan my brain and then reinstantiate, and you create a new Ray Kurzweil. If you go talk to that entity, he'll say, "This is great. You know, I've, I've, I was Ray Kurzweil, and now I'm in this new form, which I can keep going. And even when this hardware crashes, I can, you know, reinstantiate it in another machine. Uh, but I'm still here in my carbon cell-based brain. I mean, you can imagine it could be done without my even knowing about it. Uh, so I haven't really transferred my consciousness to, to this new entity." Uh, Nanotechnology ultimately will be able to keep us going a lot longer. Uh, I did write a health book, actually, that uh, will help us keep our carbon cell-based brains and bodies going longer. Uh, but I don't, I don't know how we, starting out as uh, essentially frail and mortal uh, carbon cell-based entities, can, uh, can do that. Yeah, I mean, that, there's some real issues whether it's the same person or not. I mean, I, uh, I, I talk about some of these dilemmas in the book. They're, they're fairly intricate, uh, and these are things that we've been debating for thousands of years before we had any notion of the means to implement them. So I guess we have time for one more question, this gentleman back there. Yeah, you mentioned just briefly, I think, that uh, these technologies will allow uh, for people to satisfy all the material wants 
And I was just wondering, uh, given food, clothing, and shelter is a difficult uh, thing to accomplish for many, many millions of people around the world, will these technologies somehow be able to spread themselves across you know, the, the vast population, 90% of the world, or, or could you just elaborate briefly on that? Okay. Uh, the, the issue has to do with the have, have not issue and whether or not this really will be accessible to all the world's population and uh, just because we have the theoretical means to eliminate uh, or over meet the material needs of the human race doesn't necessarily mean it will be. I mean we have the means today to feed the whole world's population but somehow the food doesn't actually get to everybody uh, so having the theoretical means to accomplish something doesn't mean it will actually happen. The, and I think the have-have-not issue will be a real issue. And I think it's one of the uh, sort of organizational and social and political issues that we should address in terms of bringing the positive side of these technologies uh, to as many people as, positive, as possible. Uh, there is a positive aspect of the technology which gets back to Moore's Law and, and the broader exponential growth of, of a technology, which is that these technologies do become more and more affordable and accessible. Ultimately, they'll be very inexpensive. I mean, we can, we're partly down that path. We can, teenager today, uh, for hundreds of dollars, or certainly a thousand dollars, can get very powerful equipment and set up their own internet company. And you have teenagers in Bombay who are making millions of dollars with, you know, secondhand computers that they got, and they have access to the internet. Uh, and so everybody has a front row seat on the world's markets. Israel that never had access to export markets now because it's everybody has a front row seat on the internet its software industry has enabled its gross national product to be twice that of Saudi Arabia it is a very powerful enabling technology uh, it's very widespread lots of people have access to it okay it still costs some money but it's ex but it's getting more and more powerful and less and less expensive and more and more widely distributed the general trend is a positive one the key enabling thing will not be so much access to the material equipment, but the knowledge of how to use it and how to apply it. Uh, the interesting thing about the internet is it's now valuing all kinds of intellectual creation, not just being a, a computer programmer, but creating intellectual creations like music, like artwork, like uh, videos, movies. Uh, I have friends who are artists who used to struggle and make $5,000 a year. And now are in tremendous demand to do graphic arts for, for the web. Uh, the web really values intellectual property, intellectual creation. But of course, to do that, people need uh, education, and that's probably going to be the key have, have not issue as we go forward. Well, thank you very much. I want, to I want to thank Ray for talking about artificial intelligence and sharing his real intelligence with us tonight. And on behalf of the Tech Museum of Innovation, we want you to have a little memento of your visit to San Jose and hope this isn't your last visit. It's a shirt. It's a shirt. It's a real shirt. <laughs> Thank you. And um, we hope that you're able to join Ray afterwards. He will be selling, not selling, he will be talking about his book with individuals. And uh, his book is called The Age of Spiritual Machines. And so this has been a great way to launch our author series. We hope that you are able to join us on the third Thursday of each month here at the Tech and that you enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you.